Last week I talked about our art project and these are the stretched canvases that start out black so that then they can have the painting done on top of them. Um, and we were testing them out to make sure that the sound still sounded good and it does and that's great news. The bad news is I was wrong last week. I, I usually have trouble saying that, don't I choir? But I was flat out wrong. I, I was thinking that our artist would be able to come in, which he did yesterday, and immediately come up with these flights of fancy and draw it out so that we'd be ready to paint tomorrow. And that's not the way it works. He needs a little time to get it, you know, to get it drawn. So I had announced that we would be painting tomorrow and Tuesday, and that is not accurate. So if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to paint with us. Uh, this is again a paint by numbers, easy painting thing. Stay tuned, but don't come tomorrow. Is that clear? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, and if you knew anyone who was going to come and help, please let them know so that uh, we don't have an army of people showing up to paint. Um, let's prepare for worship this morning by quieting our hearts and minds as we listen to this morning's prelude. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Shepherd of the Hills United Methodist Church. I'm Gaylene Boyette, one of the pastors here, and it is good to see you all in worship this morning. I want to issue a special welcome to any first time guests with us this day. We're so glad that of all the places you could be this morning, you've chosen to be with us. And uh, we want to make you feel welcome. We hope you do feel welcome as you're here worshiping with us this morning. I want to remind you all that uh, as you came in, you should have been handed a prayer and presence card. Uh, if you've been around here a while, you know it's real easy. Just fill in your name and any other information you want us to have and drop that in the offering plate as it comes by. If you're a first time guest with us, if you'd fill out as much of that information as possible, we'd love a chance to get to know you a little better. Also, if you're, it's your first time with us this morning, uh, you may notice these pink cards in the pews that say welcome. Those are introduction cards, and if you would just fill one of those out and drop it in the offering plate, you can be uh, introduced later in the service. So uh, once again, it is so good to be with you all this morning. Let us stand and join together in a couple favorite hymns.
Please be seated. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Gift giver, you call us together with our different gifts, our different ideas, and our different tastes. You call us together to share what makes us special, to build each other up, to serve each other in love. You call us together knowing that we need all parts of the body if we are to be whole. You call us together to sing, to pray, to listen, to speak, to be refreshed so that we can go out and serve. We give thanks and praise, gift giver, that you call us together. the human body. A body is a unit and has many parts, and all the parts of the body are one body, even though there are many. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek or slave or free, and we are all were given one spirit to drink. Certainly the body isn't one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, what would happen to the hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed each one of the parts of the body just like he wanted. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. If all were one and the same body part, what would happen to the body? But as it is, there are many parts, but one body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. The parts of the body that we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. The private parts of our body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor so that there won't be division in the body and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. You are the body of Christ and parts of each other. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body. 
body of Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So then let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let's throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up, and fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him and sat down at the right side of God's throne. This morning's choir anthem, Bring Them In, features a solo by a new member of our choir, Mr. Bill White. The master said to the servant, Go out into the streets and lands of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Then go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled.
After a few days, Jesus went back to Capernaum, and people heard that he was at home. So many gathered that there was no longer space, not even near the door. Jesus was speaking the word to them. Some people arrived, and four of them were bringing to him a man who was paralyzed. They couldn't carry him through the crowd, so they tore off part of the roof where, above where Jesus was. When they had made an opening, they lowered the man on which the paralyzed man was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now some legal experts were sitting there muttering among themselves, Why does he speak this way? He's insulting God. Only the one God can forgive sins. Well, Jesus immediately recognized what they were discussing, and he said to them, Why do you fill your minds with such questions? Which is easier to say to a paralyzed person, Your sons are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your bed, and walk? But so you will know that the human one has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus raised him up. <clears throat> right away he picked up his mat and walked out in front of everybody. They were all amazed and praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. This week we continue our sermon series on Creed, What Christians Believe and Why, by Adam Hamilton. Each week is based on a section of the Apostles' Creed, and this week, the church and the communion of saints based on I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Sorry. There's a stirring in the throne room and all creation holds its breath. Waiting now to see the bridegroom, wondering how the bride will dress. She wears white. She knows she's undeserving. She bears the shame of history. But this worn and weary maiden is not the bride that he sees. She wears white, head to toe, but only he can make it so. This is the opening verse to Wedding Day, uh, performed by Casting Crowns, a contemporary Christian group. It's a beautiful love song. It captures those moments as we're getting ready to prepare for a wedding, as we wait for the bridegroom to enter, as we wonder what the bride's dress is going to look like. It sounds offhand like it's based in that Christian European tradition that white is for virgins, and she wears white. But actually, it comes from the symbolism of the New Testament and especially the book of Revelation where the bride is the church, the people of God. And the bride is not without sin. She bears the shame of history. I love that line as I think back over all the complaints I've heard about the things that have been done in the name of God and Jesus Christ. We went to war against the Muslims in the Crusades and killed hundreds and thousands. We went to war against indigenous people who didn't believe and act like us and killed how many? wiped out whole civilizations. We even went to war against fellow Christians. Do you know that we have wiped out Christian communities in the name of Christ? The church in India was decimated when the British got there because their church had been founded by Thomas the Apostle 
and didn't quite match their Roman Catholic traditions or their Protestant new Roman Catholic traditions. Yes, the church bears the shame of history, and it's where Hamilton starts, both in his book and in his video series, where he talks about the book. It starts with the complaints against the church. It starts with the mass exodus from the church that has been going on for years now, for decades. It started in the 60s and the 70s and went into the 80s and has only gotten worse. As people have complained, the church is judgmental. The church is self-righteous without, <laughs> without cause. The church is uh, hypocritical. The church is not in tune with the times. The church, I am sorry to say, sometimes is boring. How can the gospel of Jesus Christ be boring? It's one of the greatest things that we can celebrate in our lives. And yet somehow we manage to make it that way. And so we have been losing members. The United Methodist Church has been losing members pretty much since it was founded. When it was founded in 1968, that was our high point. It's been losing ever since. But we're not the only denomination. There are complaints and there are legitimate complaints against the church. But notice, she wears white. And he makes it so. She's danced in golden castles and she's crawled through the beggar's dust. But she, today she stands before him and she wears his righteousness. And she will be who he adores because this is what he made her for. This is what the church is about when we say we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, we are saying that we belong to God, that we are God's people, and we will be what God has created us to be. Adam Hamilton goes through all sorts of terms. Holy, meaning sacred or set apart by or for God. Catholic, meaning everywhere or throughout. Once again, church. One of the words translated church is ecclesia, meaning an assembly or a gathering. And Hamilton reminds us of that thing Jesus said to Peter when he goes, on this rock, I will build my church, my ecclesia. And so we have right there, we're not just any gathering of people. We are Christ gathering of people. Once again, we belong to Christ and we are the body of Christ. Kyriakon also Greek, also a word that's translated church, meaning belonging to the Lord. And we get to that communion of saints. What are saints but holy people? What is holy again? Belonging to God. Time and time again, we saw in this chapter, if you are reading along with the book, this balance between the church that people has all sorts of complaints about, the church that doesn't always actually manage to be the church and the fact that we are called out by God and belong to God and therefore are holy. We together and we as individuals are saints called to belong to God. So what is the problem? Why is the church losing members? Why are people saying we're not relevant or we're judgmental or all these other things? I think Hamilton would say it's because sometimes the church is not the church. The church then is holy, Hamilton says, when those who are part of her recognize that she belongs to God and not to her members. She is holy when those who consider the church home don't ask, what can our church do for us? But rather, what does God want the church to do for God? We forget that we belong to God. The church belongs to God. And Christ would remake us in Christ's own image. 
Hamilton points out that Christ is God become human, God incarnate in the world. We celebrate that as we talk about Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. We celebrate that when we talk about the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is God incarnate in the world, but Jesus went back to heaven and God. Oh, but he did not leave us alone. Rather, he sent upon us the Holy Spirit, which created in us the church which joined us together, made us God's very own possessions. And now we are Christ incarnate in the world, just as Christ was God incarnate in the world. That whole passage from 1 Corinthians about we are the body and we have many parts and we each have gifts to offer. We each have a role to play in the church. We are the body of Christ, but the body of Christ doesn't just exist. Think about all the things that Christ was doing. Christ was teaching and Christ was preaching and Christ was healing and Christ was showing compassion to people around him and Christ was forgiving sins. What is one of the roles of the church? To forgive sins, to let people know that they can be who God created them to be. It's a wonderful thing, but it's not easy if we forget that we are Christ's assembly, gathering of people, that we are God's holy church, if we forget to do what God is asking us to do and instead follow our own ways, then yes, it all falls apart. And maybe what we should explain to the people outside our doors who say, oh, the church, I don't want any part to do of religion. I'm spiritual but not religious, right? Isn't that the, the common phrase? Maybe we need to explain to them that perhaps you didn't really go to a church. Perhaps you went to a place that forgot what being church meant forgot that being church meant being Christ for each other. Hamilton, um, Hamilton's church really celebrates the story we read from Matthew 2. I mean, from Mark. Yeah, Mark chapter 2. Where Jesus is preaching and all the people are gathered around and the house is so full they can't get this paralyzed man in. They want this man to see Jesus. They want Jesus to see him. They want to give this friend of theirs some hope, some encouragement, and maybe, maybe even Jesus can heal him. But they are not deterred by how crowded the place is. We in the church aren't deterred either. Ever notice all the chairs set up out there? We can spread. <laughs> But they're not detoured. And so they, they dig a hole in the roof and they lower this paralytic down. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And of course, he's attacked for that. And the Bible states that he doesn't forgive the man's sins because of the man's efforts, but because of the obvious love of the man's friends. It's the friends that do so much work to get the man there that Jesus can say, your sins are forgiven. And then, of course, in the end, Jesus says, take up your bed and walk, and the man walks. And all those who were there know the man's sins were forgiven, that Jesus did have the power to do that. Well, in Hamilton's church, they try to be stretcher bearers, they call them based on this story. The ones that carry the stretcher, the litter, however you want to call it, they try to be stretcher bearers to each other. Hamilton writes, the church I serve is a long con large congregation. Perhaps you've heard of Church of Resurrection. It's got multiple sites throughout the Kansas City area and people who come and join the church through web streaming from all over the world. So he writes, the church I serve is a large congregation. Ten years ago, I challenged our members, what if 
When people think of our church, they don't first think of the size of our membership, but instead the size of our heart and the way we serve the community. What is it that, uh, what if we were not known for our average weekly worship attendance, which is huge by the way, but instead for the hours our members volunteer to address the needs of the city? And what if we were known not for how well we love each other, which is a good thing, right? But instead for how willing we are to welcome and love those outside the walls of our church. At our best, the church is willing to take risks to love people and push back the darkness of poverty, suffering, and injustice while, through the good things we do, shining the light of God's love, compassion, and mercy. In this way, our actions become a compelling testimony to the world of the truth and power of the Christian gospel. They are stretcher bearers carrying each other when someone cannot make it on their own. They are stretcher bearers going in the world looking for those who are falling down. There's another song by Casting Crowns I love that talks about do you hear, do you see the ones outside the door, the lost and lonely people who are searching for the hope that's found in you and me. We are the body of Christ in the world. We are Christ incarnate in the world, and therefore we are God incarnate in the world. And that has a certain responsibility. There's a certain way we should be acting, and we are at our best when we act like Christ. When we become the hope and share it with each other instead of keeping it inside our doors or within ourselves. One of the complaints is that, well, let me go back to Hamilton. When the church is striving to be the church, she is one of the most beautiful communities in the world, a community that seeks to live selfishly, encourage and bless others, a community where you can be accepted as you are and where you will find family who will welcome you, stand by you, and encourage you. But you might say, that's not what my church looks like. But then I ask, what are you doing to help it be that kind of community? Adam is hard hitting here about who we are supposed to be at the church. Occasionally I hear people say they don't need the church. Really? You don't need encouragement from others, the blessings of worship, and all the other things you gain from being part of this community. But even if you find that without, that you don't need the church, consider this. If you are a follower of Jesus, it is not just that you need the church, but that the church needs you. Don't tuck the gospel of Jesus Christ inside yourself and not share it. The world doesn't need that. The world needs the light of Christ that lives in you. The world needs the hope of the gospel that lives in you. If you say, I don't need the church, but maybe the church needs you. There are people at church who need you to show up, Adam says, you to offer a word of encouragement, to teach a class, to lead a support group, or just stand at the door and welcome people. Just to be that encouraging. The church isn't an optional add-on to your faith. It's an essential part of being Christian. We are the body of Christ, not you or me individually. We, it takes all of us. It takes all of us working together. It takes all of us holding each other accountable. It takes all of us remembering that we are holy, meaning we belong to God. And we need to try to act that way. But we don't always, do we? We get it wrong, but we are only human. And we are going to get it wrong sometimes. That doesn't make us any less holy. What makes us 
Not holy is when we forget who we belong to. Making mistakes is not what makes us not holy. Making mistakes is what makes us human. And I think that's why I love this song so much, Wedding Day. The idea is that we are Christ incarnate here. We are the body of Christ in the world. We are Christ's hands and feet and ears and eyes and hearts and, and arms that hug and feet that walk and move. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. But ultimately, we are striving towards that wedding day. When we join the communion of saints, when we join with Christ, our bridegroom in heaven, and we will wear white. In spite of our sin and in spite of our shame and in spite of our failures, Christ sees who we are trying to be. Christ sees who God made us to be. And Christ makes us finally and completely that when we get to that communion of saints in the church triumphant. Why do I like that song? Because of the chorus. When someone dries your tears, when someone wins your heart, and says you're beautiful when you don't know you are. When all you've longed to see is written on his face. And love has finally come and set you free. Ultimately, Christ calls us to himself because of love. And ultimately, we become all that God created us to be because of love. And ultimately, we are part of the church, the communion of saints here on earth and the communion of saints in heaven because of love. Because it is love that touches our hearts and dries our tears and eventually brings us to that place where there will be no more tears. And we will see where we succeeded and we will see where we failed and none of it will matter because in the end, we belong to God and God will make it all turn out okay. When the hand that bears the only scars in heaven that touch your face and the last tears you ever cry are finally wiped away. And the clouds roll back and he takes your hand and walks you through those gates. And forever he reigns and us by his side. Because we, were, we had the courage, we had the daring to try to live by the name, the people of God, the holy Catholic Church the communion of saints. Amen. I'm supposed to make you stand and recite the creed. <laughs> we can do that, right? <laughs> Let us join together in this historic creed of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.